Welcome, I'm Ijoma Onyato. Tonight, federal government challenges states to come up with right policies to boost their economies as participants at the Open State Investors Forum confident of return to growth path. Amnesty International accuses Nigerian military of failing to prevent Dapchi schoolgirls' abduction. Despite warning, Defence Headquarters dismisses claim and challenges Amnesty to provide evidence of advanced information. Minister of State for Petroleum Resources Ibe Kachiku says Nigeria loses about 3 trillion naira worth of investment annually due to delay in the passage of the Petroleum Industry Bill. And 23 Russian diplomats and their families leave the UK in compliance with Britain's expulsion order following nerve agent spy attack. On business news tonight, Nigeria moves up 24 points to 145 in World Bank's 2018 Ease of Doing Business Report. On sports news, Don Mikel Obi and Ogane Karai Tebo ruled out as Super Eagles begin training for Friday's pre-World Cup friendly against Poland in Wroclaw. And from Abuja, federal government files amended charges of treason and felony against four co-defendants with IPOB leader Namdi Kanu. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibado, is asking state governments to come up with new innovations and strategies to boost their economies, as the federal government is always willing to support them and help them grow. Professor Oshibajo was speaking in Abeokuta, the Ogun state capital, during the flag-off of the two-day Ogun Investors Forum in Abeokuta. The Vice President is one of the speakers at the Investors Forum, which brought together economic analysts and captains of industry, including the former President of Mexico, who is the keynote speaker. It's that time of the year when Ogun State Government brings together investors, global and financial economists, market analysts, diplomats and captains of industry to the state capital, Abirkuta, to discuss economic opportunities and potential in the gateway state and in Nigeria. It is also another forum and the fourth in the series where discussions on the successes of the state government in the last seven years is put on the front burner and efforts are made to consolidate on the gains of the government on its strategic economic policies. Nigeria's Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibaju wants the state government to build on its many laurels by implementing more policies and programs that will indeed hasten development. He also promises federal government support to states for accelerated economic growth. The reward for hard work, as they say, is more work. It's heartwarming to note that Ogun State has made clear its aspiration to move from fifth place on Nigeria's Doing Business Index for states to the first place. On our part, the federal government, we will continue to do everything within our power to support every state in Nigeria to reach its full economic potential. The first panel discussion focuses on macroeconomic development, delivering a diverse, inclusive economy. This government, we've tried very hard to be as inter to be as interactive and as open as possible because you find that you know you, you don't know everything. You, you learn from the private sector. We learn what works, what doesn't work. What do you want? What don't? Sometimes we can't align. Sometimes we have to agree to disagree. And there are areas where government has to say no. This is the policy, and this is the direction. The second panel discussion takes a look at building value chains, feeding Nigeria, feeding Africa. What we need to do and what I think the governor of Ogun State has started doing and what we are doing at the center under the leadership of the vice president is that we are looking a little more into the future than we did before. The former president of Mexico, Mr. Felipe Calderon, hints on the economic growth and recovery plan of Mexico and how that can impact positively on Ogun State and Nigeria. Of course, it's very basic. You need to increase revenues, which means taxes, or reducing subsidies for gasoline and petrol, for instance. And at the same time, you need to increase, you need to reduce your expenditures. And we did so. So we were very brave doing so. But more important for us was to provide 
clear signals to the markets that Mexico was serious about fiscal responsibility. The host and governor of Ogun State, Ibukula Musum, extends an open invitation to the private sector to take full advantage of the enabling environment put in place by the state government for businesses to thrive. Ogun State is thriving, but we are not resting on our laurels. Our dear state has been rated as the second most viable state in the Federation in terms of physical sustainability. Our plan is that we want to be the most viable state in Nigeria within the, 10 years, within the next 10 years. That is the strength of the foundation we are laying for the future. We are committed to ensure that we provide an enabling environment for business to continue to grow and thrive. If the deliberations from this investors forum are implemented, Ogun State may well live up to its billing as the economic hub of Nigeria. Human rights group Amnesty International has accused the Nigerian military of failing to prevent the abduction of 110 schoolgirls in Yobe State, despite being warned in advance. In a statement, Amnesty International says security forces failed to act on advance warnings that a convoy of Boko Haram fighters was heading to Dabchi town. The statement also accuses the military of also failing to respond while the insurgents conducted an armed raid on Government Girls Science and Technical College on February the 19th. According to Amnesty International, Nigeria's director, Usayo Jigo, quote, evidence available to Amnesty International suggests that there are insufficient troops deployed in the area and that the absence of patrols and the failure to respond to warnings and engage with Boko Haram contributed to this tragedy, end of quote. Giving further details, Amnesty claims that testimonies from several credible sources show that security forces received at least five warnings prior to our hours before the Dabchi raid. Now it adds that during the attack, army officials, both in Gedam and Damaturu, were again alerted. The military only arrived in Dabchi shortly after Boko Haram left. Comparing the Dabchi raid to the Chibok episode, Amnesty says, quote, Regrettably, no lessons appear to have been learned from the terrible events at Chibok four years ago. What happened in Dabchi is almost a carbon copy of what happened in Chibok, with the security forces failing to respond to warnings and the same result for another hundred girls and their families. End of quote. The group is asking the federal government to investigate what it describes as inexcusable security lapses that allowed the abduction to take place without any effort to prevent it. Meanwhile, the Nigerian military has challenged the international watchdog Amnesty International to come up with evidence to verify its claim that the military was aware of the abduction of Dabchi schoolgirls but did nothing to stop it. The military, through its spokesperson, Brigadier General John Agim, dares Amnesty International to produce the telephone numbers used in sending the alert and to which security force and unit. The defense headquarters describes the statement of the human rights watchdog as outright falsehood and an attempt to whip up sentiments and mislead members of the public. The military says Amnesty International intends to breed bad blood between Nigeria and some countries which hope to partner the country in its fight against insurgency. Part of the statement of the defense headquarters reads, quote, President Trump of the United States of America has agreed to collaborate with the current government of Nigeria to end insurgency in the Northeast, and AI wants to do everything within its powers to make sure that the U.S.-Nigeria Anti-Terrorism Corporation does not succeed. End of quote. The statement describes the Nigerian armed forces as having attained the highest form of professionalism in line with international best practices and could not have ignored warnings that will help them do their job better. Now, the accusation leveled against the Nigerian military by the human rights group Amnesty International for failing to prevent the abduction of 110 schoolgirls is another sore reminder of a similar claim four years ago when the Chibok girls were abducted. In this report, our correspondent Orelua Shunibari looks at the submissions of the human rights group against the federal government. <laughs> Tears of broken fathers. Their daughters are among the 110 abducted girls from the Technical College Dabchi, Yobe State, on February 19th. The federal government swooped in with energy and enthusiasm in an attempt to douse any sign that the Boko Haram had gained an upper hand. Their power has gone down completely. They have been pushed out of Sambisa. And they now, you see, oxygen. 
the oxygen is publicity. This is what they are looking for. Something that would grab world attention. But I can tell you that with determination of our gallant officers and men, the days of Bukhara is almost over. In this exclusive interview with Channels Television, the defense minister gives an assurance that the federal government is throwing everything but the kitchen sink into locating the girls. We have uh, dispatched all the surveillance devices we have in terms of air, human resource intelligence and other force that needed to be uh, in place by all possible means and we have uh, made sure that all this needed is being done to see that these girls are being found out where, or, I mean wherever they are. But the flip side of the efforts being made by the federal government is this report by the Amnesty International which claims that the abduction should not have taken place in the first place because fair warning was given through phone calls that the Boko Haram group was advancing into Dapchi. So in a case reminiscent of the Chibok Girl saga, the Amnesty International and the military are at loggerheads over the February 19 abduction. But on hindsight, there should not be anything to discuss if this abduction was never allowed to happen in the first place. Now to discuss the troubling state of affairs, I'm being joined from Abuja by the country director, Amnesty International Nigeria, Osai Ojigo. Thank you so much for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, but before we move ahead, let's just say that our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the Dapchi girls as we discuss this issue tonight, as some of them may be listening, just to, just to put that in there. Now let's look at your report, and it says that this should never have happened because the military had advance warning. So the question to you now is, are you willing to provide proof publicly? Thank you very much. Um, the evidence we have is based on high witnesses' statements, as well as those who called to alert the authorities that there was a convoy of suspected Boko Haram insurgents coming to the area, and that they had specifically asked for directions to a school as well as to the nearest security post. So those calls were made, and, it's, and the information regarding where the, the calls were made can also be provided. Okay, well just to say that attempts to get the defense information spokesperson to our studios tonight were unsuccessful as we knew you'd have you on. But just clear this up for us. Which security force and unit um, did you, had prior knowledge of this Dachi attack? Can you identify them for us tonight? You said calls were made. Do you know which ones? Yes, calls were made to the military um, as well as um, to the police in um, your base state, particularly because Dapchi itself did not have any emerging troops based there. So the nearest town, which is Gendam, about 50 kilometers away from Dapchi, there is a battalion there. Then there's also another troops installed around another 54 kilometers away from Dapchi in Babangida. So the villagers, one thing we need to realize is that because this is an area um, Yobe, Adamawa, Bono are areas where Boko Haram insurgency is a daily occurrence, is a daily um, fear that people in these communities have. They've already built an interaction with the security forces. And so what that means is that they have access to them and they know where to call out, where to reach out when um, there's a crisis or where there's a distress. So they know who to reach out to. And in this particular occasion, the response was acknowledged that, okay, we are monitoring the situation, mm. but then nothing was done within the four hours where at least five calls were made. Okay, finally, let me just ask you, looking at Dapchi, looking at what happened in Chibok, and just looking at the, the military's response generally to the, to the insurgency, is there anything that Amnesty can say the military has done right or that, that, you're, that you're satisfied with? Because often the, the criticism is that um, the reports that come out from Amnesty are, are harsh and not often true. This is what they, they, they tend to claim. I think they tend to look more in terms of the facts that we've brought to light rather than the attempts through which they could have better instructed um, their troops to act. 
In this particular case, after the incident happened, the military, the Air Force, the, um, there were some Air Force jets seen after Boko Haram had taken the girls away, presumably to scout the area to see if there were any uh, remnants or if they could identify any of the movements because they left the city immediately after picking up the girls. And then the military troops that did come came after the attack had happened. We have consistently said it's not that the authorities, in this case the military or other agents, don't have the troops, but it's how quickly they mobilize themselves and how quickly they are able to ensure they can thwart things before they happen. And oftentimes when they come to the scenes of this sort of incident, they are already a bit too late. So we would like to see better response times and also better mobilization in terms of responding to cries for help. All right. All right, Country Director Amnesty International, Osai Ojigo, thank you for coming on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you. And in part two, after the break, President Buhari meets with former Vice President Namadi Sambo behind closed doors at the villa in Abuja. That's in a moment. Please stay with us.